right. Um, my name is Hans Charles. I'm a cinematographer, also professor of cinematography in the production track at GMU's um, film program. And I'm so ha um, happy to be here. We have our visitor filmmaker series online curated by the associate program director, Cynthia Fuchs. And the visiting filmmaker series has been brought has brought films and artists to the Mason campus for 20 years. And in this new incarnation, the series brings these artists to your home screens. Like I said, my name is Hans Charles and we have uh, an amazing guest. We have a uh, director, writer, musician, uh, cultural critic, Sasha Jenkins as our guest speaker. Um, make sure you mute your microphones. If you wanna ask a question, you can type it in the group chat. You can raise your hand virtually. Uh, <clears throat> The virtual uh, filmmaker series is online is sponsored by the film and video studies program here at Mason CHSS CVPA in the English department, the school of art, global affairs and global programs, CVPA's Krinkros, Krinkros series, arts and context, university libraries, film and media studies and the interdisciplinary curriculum committee, history and art and art history, university life, Women and Gender Studies. Um, so I was brought to you by all those programs. So, <clears throat> like I said, our guest is Sasha Jenkins. If you don't know who Sasha is, besides Googling, I can give you sort of a quick rundown. Um, Sasha, I would consider Sasha, he's a journalist, filmmaker, sort of cultural critic. Um, he's also a musician. So I think like Sasha at his heart is, a, is an artist, but a, a lot of you will know Sasha from, from his directing and, and the films that he's been directing lately, the latest being um, Wu-Tang Clan of Mikes and Men for Showtime. You were the cinematographer. Uh, you're, you're not mentioning that. You said what? You were the cinematographer on that film. Well, yeah, but this is not my film. This is not my filmmaker series. This is yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. You, know? <laughs> you noted that the, the lovely cinematography was performed by the gentleman who is speaking, not me, but the other gentleman I'm pointing to. I, I was the cinematographer on Routine Clans of Mikes and Men. Um, and so, you know, for me, Sasha made a movie called Burn, Hollywood Burn. Um, burn MF or Burn, actually. Burn, burn, okay, Burn MF or Burn. Burn Motherfucker Burn, Fresh Dressed. There are a series of sort of docu, cultural docu um, films that Sasha has been making in the, in, this sort of latter part of his career. And this brings me back to this is the question, the first question I want to ask you. Years ago, I was taking, way before I ever picked up a camera, but I definitely wanted to become a filmmaker. I was taking this course in New York and it was, uh, it was a magazine writing course, long form. And the woman who was teaching the course was a magazine editor. And I said to her, I said to me, it seems that, because at the time I was really interested in, in long form pieces, and this is you know your background. I said long form pieces seem very similar to documentary, like to good documentary pieces. And for me at the time, I don't know if I was just seeing ahead of time and just seeing where documentary was going, um, but there seemed to be a correlation to like an amazing, you know, if you think of a piece and vibe on on Biggie, a 5,000 word piece or on hip hop or on a particular album. Um, and so I see the early parts of your career seem to bookend where you are now, because you started in the early part of your career, you started as a writer, you started as a journalist, you started as somebody who delved into specific cultural things that you were curious about and you felt like the world needed to know about. So talk a little bit about that. It started out actually with me publishing my own magazines. When I was uh, in my teens, I published a zine called Graphic Scenes in Explicit Language. Sorry, it's loud New York City motorcycles in the background. But when I was 17, I published a zine called Graphic Scenes in Explicit Language, which was about graffiti or the graffiti subculture that started in New York and in Philadelphia. I published that for some time. Then I eventually did a record review in that zine, which led me to publishing a hip hop newspaper called Beatdown, which led to me publishing another, another magazine called the Ego Trip, which led to me writing for magazines like Vibe and eventually becoming an editor. And so my interests started 
with me, I always have to be a participant in one way or another to really sort of captivate my interest and really push where I want to take the conversation. So it started with my interest in graffiti. And in the time since I've written numerous books, I got a fellowship to the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia on the strength of my knowledge of graffiti. So it, it, it all started with my interest in graffiti as a young graffiti writer in New York City in the, in the 70s and 80s, and then transitioning into hip hop sort of having its own media, mm -hmm. hip hop becoming conscious of itself, and hip hop not necessarily having outsiders writing about it as a, as a curiosity, but now having people who are of the culture sort of documenting and telling our stories. So with me, it kind of starts with, I guess in many ways, hip hop, sort of being an active participant in that I was just a kid in New York City and hip hop was the culture that we all grew up with. No one knew that it was gonna go on to make millions and zillions of dollars and change people's lives. And it was my interest in, in, in hip hop that pushed me and pushed my curiosity further and further. And then on top of that, my father was a filmmaker and television producer as well. Um, he passed away when I was young, but uh, you know, I have very fond and strong memories of him being who he was and doing what he did. And I think in the back of my mind that always kind of pushed me to to go forward, but he was a documentary, primarily, initially a documentary filmmaker. So my entire life, uh, my mom is from Haiti and she's a painter, um, painting in a traditional Haitian style. So my entire life I was exposed to the arts and exposed to people who were interested in culture. And I think that just kind of naturally spilled over to what I wound up doing today. And kind of, I want to kind of go down the rabbit hole of of you as a graffiti writer. And I, talk to me about that form of expression. What is it about graffiti? What is it that graffiti writers have to say? What is it that has to come out of them to express it in the way that they do? Yeah, for me, thinking about it now, um, you know, it's. And it's the power of hip hop in that you rename yourself, you you rebrand yourself, and you have total control over that identity. When you're, you know, a person of color in inner city New York where the schools aren't great and no one really has any great expectations for you, what can you do to sort of say that you're here, that you that you matter, and have a platform to say these things? And initially, you're just communicating with other kids in the subculture. You're not really interested in, in what everyone else has to say about what you're doing. And then the art started to evolve, and it started to invite more people in. Because really, graffiti, it's language, right? It's a style of language that you have to be initiated into. And if you don't know the language, then it doesn't make any sense. So it makes sense to us. So it went from making sense to us to making sense to a broader range of people. And now obviously it's in galleries around the world and I have friends who are multimillionaires on the strength of their graffiti. I was just, I was nobody special in the graffiti world. There was a time when every kid in my neighborhood wrote graffiti, it was just your alias or your nickname. I just happened to stick with it much longer. And you know, what has it done for me? It, it, it's given me an identity. It got me to Columbia University for free the Graduate School of Journalism. It got me to publish my first magazine. Um, it's got me to curate major exhibitions. Uh, it's, 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 been a, it's been a life changing experience for me. Not everyone has this experience. For most people, it was a time in their lives when if you were really prolific, you were popular in the subculture and then you turned 21 and then you moved on. There are guys in their 60s who didn't know, who were so disconnected from the culture that they didn't know that something they painted in 1974 had such a profound influence on a guy like Cause or, or major street artists today. They were so disconnected. And then when they become reconnected and reunite with these people they haven't seen in 50 years, they're blown away by the fact that this artwork that they created as kids, which wasn't intended for galleries, wasn't intended to make anyone rich. It was just an act of expression. That that simple act of expression has come to influence 
a broad range of people, places, disciplines, et cetera. I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, said no, you did. no, you definitely did because that I think that sort of gives us an overview of to me like like how graffiti goes from one specific place to being this sort of almost high art form if we're looking at it retrospectively. Um, but it, it also, for me, connects a through line in your life that this sense of a link of culture and a link of expression seems to be a theme leading up to you becoming a director. Like you, you've always seemed to be gravitating to spaces that allow you to kind of express and to speak on a larger platform what you see, what you're doing, and to connect to the interesting people around you. And like, for me, that's why I'm so curious about your career um, as a journalist and as a publisher, because I feel like you were publishing and you were a journalist at probably one of the more interesting times in hip hop, you know, like hip hop is emerging, hip hop is sort of um, staking its claim in the American consciousness. And you seem to be at the thick of it, a Queens kid who's a graffiti writer and now, a, you know, now a hip hop publisher and writer and a musician. So talk to me a little bit about that period in your life. When, we, when I was publishing magazines? Yeah, when you're publishing magazines and you're writing. Like there's, I mean, that's a big chunk, but that, that, that to me is an interesting sort of, sort of period. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're doing it, you're not thinking about it. I wasn't really, it was really survival um, and trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, you know, I've, I've, I have some, I've attended some colleges and, and I um, got a fellowship to the Graduate School of Journalism, but my, my nice Haitian mom is still asking me when I'm going to graduate from college. Um, so I was always very restless and writing to me was just an opportunity to express myself. And I eventually learned, at first when I was publishing magazines and newspapers, um, I thought I knew what I was doing until Greg Tate, the legendary writer Greg Tate, yeah. told me that he thought my newspaper was cool, and that, but I needed an editor. And I didn't even know what an editor was. And I remember saying to myself, fuck you, old man, you don't know shit. But little did I know that Greg Tate was 2,000% right. And once I encountered great editors, it just took what I was doing to another level. And the collaborative process between a writer and an editor, and that kind of goes to what you're saying about the natural transition from journalism to filmmaking, the, 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 the connection between director and, and editor to me is reminiscent of what my relationship was with editors of magazines. And when you have a great rapport with an editor, it just makes your work so much better. And um, I've had the great fortune of working with great editors on the projects I've done over the years. Um, but when we were making the magazines, I mean, some of the things that I think about now that, like everyone knows Mark Ronson, right? Mark Ronson used to write for my, magazine when he was an NYU student. And the funny thing is, the first night he met me and we laughed about it, he thought I was Funkmaster Flex, which if you, know, if you know who Funkmaster Flex is, that's ridiculous. You guys look nothing alike. No, but we're black. So Mark Ronson thought we looked alike. But you look at where Mark Ronson is now. Yeah. Superstar producer. Right. One of the biggest producers in the world, and he was just so happy and in love with hip hop. He was just so humbled, wanted to write about it, wanted to learn about it, and you see where he is now. So there's so many stories like that where, you know, I've had the great fortune of interviewing some of the biggest names in the game, like Eminem. I wound up doing a book with Eminem. I mean, you know, when you learn, when you see the records, when he was in middle school, there was a kid named D'Angelo Bailey who used to bully him. Yeah and would physically abuse him. And I spent time in Detroit with Eminem and I had to do a follow up interview with him over the phone. And I got the court records and I read back to him, you know, what happened. And he had sort of blocked it out and he got so emotional because he was like, how did you know this? How did you, how did you, how did you come across this? And it was, it was journalism, you know, and it, it made a difference in 
my rapport with him. It, you know, it, it got him to open up more and sort of trust me and give me things that he probably wouldn't have given other people. So my experience as a writer, writing about music, particularly in the world of hip hop, definitely has given me an advantage in terms of what I do as a uh, documentary filmmaker. That's a great segue because there are, obviously there are different types of documentary films one can make, but, um, Somebody asked me, a, a mutual friend of ours, asked me what I thought about you having worked with you. <clears throat> and I said, well, the thing about Sasha is, is when Sasha sits in the chair, there's nobody better prepared to interact with the, with the subject than Sasha is. Um, with all the people that I've sort of ever sat with, or, or almost everybody that I've ever sat with in terms of as a cinematographer. And I always, for me, the reason that was... I'm delving so much into your background as a writer is because I feel like those instincts are naturally go hand in hand as a documentary filmmaker. Right. You know, for me, one of the things that documentary directors do is they sit in the chair with a subject, um, especially informational documentaries, documentaries where you're talking to people about a specific thing or an event and they're drawing out of their subjects the stories that in some ways, some of the stories they already know in their head, they from the information they've garnered and their or their their discovery process. And to me, that old school journalism, the pre blog journalism that your generation did. A lot of those, some of those, like, you know, the Dream Hamptons of the world have made that transition. Some people have made that transition. But a lot of people there, I mean, there were thousands of writers from that time who had, who had amazing pieces. They are all not making film, um, documentary films. What led you to your first documentary film? What led to that? What was the impetus? What was in you that you jumped from writing pieces to then starting to make movies? Because if, if you were... And you could talk a little about this. If making writing magazine pieces, publishing magazines is difficult for whatever, well, making movies is, is that much harder. Right. Right. Well, first we started producing television. I used to publish a magazine called Ego Trip, mm -hmm. led to a few books. One book was The Book of Rap Lists, which just has lots of random facts about hip hop. From there, we did a, a a book called Ego Trip's Big Book of Racism. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting study on race, uh, a, a satirical sort of look at race. And someone gave that book to a woman named Christina Norman, who was big time at Viacom at the time. And she loved the book. And then she gave it away as a stocking stuff for one Christmas. And then someone said, hey, we should do a show with these guys. So in around 2001, we started doing television shows with VH1. We were the first to really get rappers on television. You know, now you have this whole genre of really horrible, I call them black exploitation, rap exploitation shows where like people are always throwing drinks on people. Um, that all started with Jim Jones and they met Jim Jones and a lot of those folks through me at VH1 because I knew that rappers have the biggest personality. You know, they, they Athletes have horrible personalities, but rappers for, for, for a particular kind of television, they're great. So I produced, we produced, Ego Trip produced a bunch of shows. One was called TV's Illest Minority Moments, where we explored the roles uh, folks of color have typically had on television over the years. And then we did a series called Race Arama, which was a three part sort of meditation on race and popular culture. And then one Christmas, Eve, a guy named Jim Ackerman, who was big cheese at VH1 at the time, said, hey, what do you guys want to do next? You guys should do a reality show. And we were drunk. And I said, we should do a show called The White House. We make white rappers go to the South Bronx, and they learn everything they need to know about hip hop. And they said, that's a great idea. So we wound up doing a show called The White Rapper Show on VH1. And um, that was a hit. Then we did a second season, which was called Miss Rap Supreme, which is about women in hip hop and how they were marginalized. Then from there, I wound up becoming a partner at a production company because I had the desire to do more and the opportunities were coming in. And then 
I developed a show called Being Terry Kennedy. Terry Kennedy is an African-American skateboarder. Um, that was on BET. And then what led to documentary directing, there was a film I was in a co on called 50 Cent, The Origin of Me. And that was on VH1. And basically 50 Cent went to South Carolina uh, where he reconnected with his great aunt and learned about his ancestry in the region. And we wound up going to the plantation that is still owned by the family that owned his family 150 years ago. And 50 wound up going there with his great aunt and the owner of the plantation is like an 88 year old physician and really sweet man. And he gave 50 and his aunt gifts. And he said, you know, Mr. 50 Cent, I'm really sorry about what happened here. And, you know, it was a really interesting yet bizarre moment. 50's great aunt had to leave because she had driven by that house thousands of times her entire life and had no idea that her family had this connection there. And then there were black people in the kitchen still working, so it made her feel uncomfortable. And then there was a scene during that documentary where there was this museum dedicated to the red, the red shirts. Now, the red shirts are the original clan. Literally, it's a shrine to the Ku Klux Klan. And this woman is giving 50 Cent a straight-faced sort of breakdown of all these great proto-clan leaders. The most bizarre thing. And the director kind of had a brain fart, and he didn't know what to do. He's like, I don't know what to do right now. I don't know what to do. Like, what do I do? Go, hand, go take care of this. And, I, and then, you know, I'm sort of directing the scene all of a sudden, and 50 Cent's halfway engaged, but he's not. The woman said something about Mongolian slaves. So I'm behind the wall, like 50. Ask her, what do you mean by Mongolian slaves? So he's like, what do you mean by Mongolian slaves? She's like, yeah, we had some Mongolian slaves here. But, you know, so the whole exercise was really ridiculous. But in that moment, I realized, like, I can do this. This is easy for me. Um, and so some years later, I had a meeting with a friend of mine who was working for Rockefeller Clothing. And Rockefeller Clothing wanted to do a commercial, a half hour commercial on BET. This is when Rockefeller was in decline. This is BET's clothing line. They wanted to do an infomercial on the virtues of Rockefeller clothing for BET. And my friend was in a marketing meeting and he raised his hand. And for some reason he said, you don't want to do that. You need to talk to my friend, Sasha Jenkins. I, I didn't put him up to it. They did that. So I came in for a meeting and I said, you know, I've been developing an idea about the history of hip hop fashion, what you should do is do a film that tells the overall story of hip hop fashion and rock is in it. So it feels more organic and a half hour commercial on BET that's gonna cost you a million dollars to make an air is just not worth your money. So after a lot of back and forth, everyone there said they liked it, but they had to get Jay-Z sign off. Um, so I called my agent at CAA at the time and I said, look, um, th these folks want to do this film, Jay-Z's involved, and the agent said, if you can get Jay-Z on tape, we can sell this. Next thing I know, I get a call from the Rock Rockaware people, and they're like, can you go to England tomorrow? If you can go to England tomorrow, you can get Jay-Z on camera. So we worked it out. I go to England. It's the last stop on a major tour. I forget which one. Florence and the Machine's there. This one's there. That one's there. And I see Jay-Z backstage and he goes to everyone except me. And I'm like, wow, I just flew all the way out of here. This guy's not gonna talk to me. He finally wakes, makes his way over and says, I see you, we're gonna do this. Don't worry, I'm like, okay. Next thing you know, someone touches me on my shoulder and hands me some champagne and it's Rihanna. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Um, eventually I got to do the sit down interview with Jay, which was great. We cut together a sizzle. I took meetings. I wound up meeting a gentleman you know, uh, Vinny, who is now at Showtime, then he was at CNN Films. He's an Indian brother from New Jersey who understood and loved hip hop. I said, I want to do this film about the history of hip hop fashion. Next thing you know, Sasha Jenkins, Max Appeal, and CNN Films did a film called Fresh Dressed. And that has, in the time since, 
five years ago, I've done, I don't know how many films since, it's opened so many doors for me. So that's the short story of how I got into it. What, when you did Fresh Dress, like you, and, and it seems like in telling that story, you did a lot of what you would do just as a journalist. As a journalist for hip hop, especially, you're at some club, you're at some studio, you're at somebody's house, you gotta wait to get an interview. And somehow you some form of patience, some form of the ability to kind of read a space and not kirk out. What did, did you learn? What would you have liked to have known doing Fresh Dress? that you know now in your latest project? Like, what's the contrast to you? Well, Fresh Dressed is a smorgasbord, you know, talking to lots of people about a subject. Lately, I've had the opportunity to focus in on, on, on individuals or groups. So what, what, did I, what, would I, what did I learn from Fresh Dressed? Um, what mistakes did you make in Fresh Dressed as a, you know, as the first time you're really sitting in that chair? Like you went around the meetings, you sold this thing, and then that you didn't do, like, for example, in Wu-Tang. Yeah, editing. Like we went through a couple of editors, um, and part of it is, is my fault. I don't think that the editors were inept. I think that I was still learning how to communicate with them. And, you know, in general, you have better rapports with some people over others, but it, I think we struggled a bit in the edit. You know, I think we struggled way longer than we should. And I look at that film now, there are definitely things that I would do differently, but, and things that I wish would have made it. Like, there was a whole subplot where I had a mannequin. There was a mannequin that I took all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's in one scene. And I, I didn't really push for it at a certain point because certain people were hating on it. But there was a character in the film that was a mannequin that went, went from point A to point B, and there was a whole subplot with the mannequin. It didn't make the cut. Um, but now the mannequin is in a scene in the Bronx uh, in front of a clothing store, uh, and no one would know that there was a whole subplot that that mannequin went to France. Like a subplot. Went to Colette. Went to all these fancy places around the world. No one knows that. What was the subplot with the mannequin? What was the subplot? Well, the, the mannequin was sort of the personification of your average inner city kid. And kind of the evolution from wearing sportswear to where we are with high fashion. And where fresh dress leaves off is where it all is now. It's all high fashion. It's all Gucci. It's all like... It's all, yeah. You know, we went to Mexico to interview Kanye and... Um, you know, they told us we only had 20 minutes. And although he was 20 minutes late, which is early for, for some rappers, I, I stopped the interview. Like, I could have kept going. He's like, you don't want more? I'm like, no, I'm good. You know, we're cool. He would have gone on and on. Um, but he's so passionate about talking about fashion. Yeah. He understands the, the, um, the hip-hop aesthetic is so naturally in step with what high fashion has always represented, what it's always wanted to be. And because that world has kind of fallen off and now hip hop dictates what's really cool, Fresh Dress was at the tail end of them finally recognizing, okay, we gotta let these Negroes in, fuck it. We have no choice. We're gonna die if we don't put them on the boat where the boat is gonna sink. So Fresh Dress was at the very, where the fashion world was like, okay, I think we got to make some changes here. And people have asked me, why don't you do Fresh Dress 2? And I'm like, no, I, I made my statement. Someone else should do it. I'm not interested. You know, I like to focus on a subject and move on. Like Wu-Tang, people really like it. Hey, you should do a Jizza documentary. And like I did, I made my statement. Like someone else can do that. Like, let someone else uh, say something. I'm going to move on to something else. Let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you an aesthetic question because you seem to be a person who has a specific sense of aesthetics that comes from a specific place and time. And by that, I mean, you're from Queens. You're a New York kid completely enmeshed in hip hop and its evolution and its growing upness. 
um, you, you're a musician, you make a, a specific type of music. You were a graffiti writer, even though you sort of downplayed, you know, whatever your aesthetic was. When you started consistently making documentary films, did you have a sense of what your aesthetic was going to be? What was going to be like if, if, if we were to use a rap analogy, what was going to be your style? What were the beats that you're going to pick? What was what were, what was a Sasha Jenkins film going to feel like? Is that something you're deciding now or is that something that you knew from the jump that you were going to be able to do? I think it goes back to the, com the conversation about interview technique. And for me, it's about connecting with people. Having their trust. Like so many people are like, how did you get Ghostface to say that? You know, and you were there. What did I do? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to listen to people. You have to connect. I've seen so many interviewers have a list of questions, and I have a list of questions too, but they'll literally ask, I heard you like the Big Mac. How many Big Macs have you had in a day? And then I'll say, well, I think I've, the most Big Macs I ever had in a day was three. And then they move on to the next question. You know, with me, I have my palette that I reference, and then I'm listening. And then Ghostface says, yeah, my greatest day of eating Big Macs, I had four Big Macs, and I had green suede shoes on. And I'm, I'm going to be like, yo, tell me about the green suede shoes. Why? Why do you remember that? You got to be able to listen, go down these rabbit holes, because that's where the best stuff happens. And it's a natural human instinct to where if you feel like I'm listening to you, if you feel like I'm appreciating you and I'm connecting with you, they're going to give you the goods. So many people are disconnected, and I want people to see my films and feel a connection to the subject. I don't want people to feel like it's missionary or it's, uh, it's just straight. I want people to feel like they're actually getting real nuance and, 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 and they're going to have enough information for themselves to like taste and smell the subject matter, to be there, to feel like they were a part of something and feel like they understand the motivations behind why these things were created by these people. So I don't know if that's an aesthetic. Um, I don't know if that's an, you know, if that answers your aesthetic question, but, but I think it's the, it's what ties all my films together. Well, where does, but where does that come from? Where does the impetus to be patient to listen come from? I mean, you know, it comes from feeling like no one understands or listens to me. I mean, I think it's it's not even uh, it's not even hard to say that. I've, I've I've felt different. You know, my my background is different. I mean, I grew up in the hood with a single parent. My mom being from Haiti, and you know, so I've got Haitian culture. I've got African American culture. I've got the Greek kids who live up the block, the Italian kids. And I come from a really diverse family. I moved from Maryland. I moved from Silver Spring, Maryland to Queens in 1977. That was culture shock. Um, so I was always different. And that's why I always gravitated to these subcultures where I could have some kind of control over the narrative. I can be a participant. You know, while I was involved with hip hop and graffiti, I was also on the punk scene in New York City, which was largely white. But what I was able to glean by being involved in all these subcultures, it's all the same thing. It's all kids who are looking for outlets, who are really creative, and who are motivated to do things. So me having the benefit of being into hip hop and punk rock and graffiti, what do they all have in common? Young people who are motivated to be heard, who feel misunderstood, and who feel driven to create work that reflects who they really are. And so me having a knowledge, and also it's language, right? So it's like the punk scene, although we know black people created rock and roll and white people had a heavy hand in it, I never felt uh, like I was a foreigner in a, in a world, even though it was dominated by white people, but there are some cultural differences. And so when you're exposed to those cultural differences, you learn about people. And so then your vocabulary expands and you understand, you know, Paulie, 
who's half Italian, half Irish, from Woodside, Queens, you understand kind of his background. You've met his parents. You see his life. You understand why he sees the world in a particular way. And so coming from Silver Spring, Maryland, to the story of Queens in the 70s, I had an education in people that I took with me that opened me up to lots of different ideas. I never was like, oh, that's a white boy did, or I can't do that because it's different. If I was interested in it, I was going to try it. And in trying all these different things, I met lots of different people. And that just expanded my cultural vocabulary exponentially. And that has given me, I think, a, an edge that a lot of other filmmakers, and particularly like Black filmmakers, don't have. Having the Caribbean sort of experience and the African American experience, that covers a lot of ground. And then also trying to figure out what it means to be an American, because whether you're Haitian or African American in many respects, based on how we've been treated in this country, we're not necessarily viewed as Americans. So that search for identity, that self-styled identity, and me taking it from, what am I? I'm hip hop, I'm punk rock, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a storyteller, I'm this, I'm that, my fashion aesthetic is this. I created that. And that is a reflection of what America is supposed to be. America is supposed to borrow from all these things and, and create something new. And I guess that's why that makes me an American filmmaker or an American storyteller. You said something before that I found interesting. You said that you like to be a participant, but yeah. watching your movies, um, it's not like there are some documentary filmmakers like a Michael Moore, where M Michael is in the film, right? Um, <clears throat> You're not always putting yourself in front. You're not always identifying yourself as a character. And yet your voice, we can sense your voice, especially if we watch over a series of films. So how are you participating? Like, what's your, what's your participation while not, while the audience isn't always seeing you in front of the camera? Well, you can hear my voice. You know, my voice winds up staying when it's applicable, when it makes sense. That's what I'm saying. Like sometimes we hear your voice, but it's not like there are some filmmakers where that's a that's a, an aesthetic. Right. You hear them ask the question. You don't always make that the case. You you may use it for context, but it doesn't stay necessarily. So how are you participating? Like explain that a little bit more. In, in the case of Wu Tang Clan, like I'm about the same age as those guys. I grew up in New York City at the same time. I'm black. I understood. Yusef Hawkins, I understood Howard Beach, I understood you know, growing up in Astoria, Queens, which is largely Greek and Italian, they're from Staten Island, you know, um, so I understand what their sort of upbringing was like. So in a way, I participated in that. Me having a similar kind of background gave me the, the understanding that I needed to pull out the most that I could from those guys. So in that case, I, maybe that's a little esoteric, but I, I had a common experience, and that, in my mind, I define that in one way as being a participant in remembering music from a particular time and it having a certain meaning to me when a, when when so and so was on video music box for the first time. You know, all of these sort of cultural moments that were a part of this subculture of you know youth in New York City at that time, not everyone speaks that language. In order to speak that language, I had to have been a participant. So that's kind of what I mean, if that makes sense. I mean, Dapper Dan, I knew who Dapper Dan was. And if you were in the subculture, you knew who Dapper Dan was. And when he was in Fresh Dress, that was right when he was starting to make a bit of a comeback. Yeah. And after Fresh Dress, you know, Dapper Dan now has a beautiful brownstone in Harlem. And, you know, I was recently nominated for an Emmy on the wonderful thing that you were on Wu Tang of Mike's and Men, and he outfitted me with a beautiful and my wife with a beautiful Dapper Dan custom made Gucci shoes, bags. You know, I knew that Dapper Dan was important, and the only way for me to know that Dapper Dan was important before everyone knew, because they all know now, I had to be a participant. So that's kind of what I mean by that. I I remember sitting. Um, watching one of the interviews of Wu-Tang 
and it, you know, there's another film that we worked on um, together as well. And I remember the subject you said you mentioned something, asked the subject something, and they were like, "How do you know that?" And you're like, "Well, you know, I just do my research." And I remember kind of systematically watching over and over again that that the preparation before you sat in the chair really influence what you got out of the subject. So I, I understand like in this conversation, you mentioned, well, you just want to make people comfortable and you listen, but there was something about preparation that seemed to make a huge difference, even in difficult interviews. By difficult interviews, I mean, people who are just naturally reluctant to talk about themselves when a camera is present. Well, Tell me well, a little bit about that, about preparation for you. Well, I know from being on the other hand, on the other side of the coin, being interviewed myself. I had a couple of interviews where there, someone's asking me questions, but they didn't do the research and they didn't. And I'm just like, I had to say, then why are you doing this interview? Like you're wasting your time and more importantly, my time. And I've been in situations where I've seen rappers they'd have these press days or, or, you know, you would hear the tail end of an interview from someone else before you got to go. And you see the artist being frustrated, like, you didn't do, it's just, it's actually disrespectful. If, if I'm expecting someone to give me so much of themselves, I should at least have the decency to do the research, to be prepared. I think it's just a part of, if, you know, you have this, you know, like when we interviewed Ghostface in California, like it took us months to finally get him to agree and track him down. He just happened to be in California. And so we made it happen, you know, and even in that situation, you're not always right. Like I got from a good source that the song Protect Your Neck was about Ghostface getting shot in the neck. He indeed was shot in the neck. I asked him the question. I was like, so you know, I always heard that Protect Your Neck was based on you getting shot in the neck. And his reaction was like, no, you know, where did you hear that? That's not true. And that was a genuine reaction. It's almost better than if it was true. He could have been like, yes, yeah, I got shot in the neck. Instead, we got, yo, what are you talking about? That's not true. It's crazy, you know? Um, so to me, being prepared is key if you want your subject to give you what you want from them. It's, 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 it's an exchange. I see it as a conversation, and I always equate it to, you know, Christmas time. My Haitian cousins, there'd be two Christmases. Friday night would be at their house. And then Saturday they come to my house. And some of these cousins, I remember meeting them for the first time, and we're all in my room at the kids' table. It's like, how do you connect with these people you don't know? So every time I'm interviewing someone, I'm at the kids' table with my cousins for the first time, figuring out how do I connect with these guys? How do I become family with them? And as a journalist, you're not really family but someone really has to be able to trust you on the level of a family member if you're going to get the best that you can get. And does your background as a journalist kind of feed into that, or do you, are you operating on another level when it comes to the filmmaking? I, mean, I think from what I understand, I generally ask lots of questions, and it can be annoying. Like I had a friend of mine who told me that his friend was like, yo, what's up with your man asking me all these questions? Like, you know, is he trying to get me arrested? And it's like, I just think everyone has an interesting story, like how your parents came together, your background, your last name fascinates me. I can have a conversation with anyone, so I'm just naturally inquisitive. So you, you, you match my inquisitive nature with research and a real good conversation, and that's what you get. I mean, before I was a journalist, I was just inquisitive. You're just, you're just nosy. You're hood nosy, or you're just you. Are you the person that approached somebody and talking at the party and just starts asking questions, or what? No. What? Because I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find a through line for how they sort of overcome whatever to to be more focused and inquisitive and prepared the way you are in 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 difficult in, in tackling difficult subject matters. That, so is it a, is it nurture its nature or is it? Well, I think you you anyone that you want to interview, you've got to put yourself in their shoes. You got to think about what they've been through. You've got to think about 
what their goals and aspirations are. You got to think about what their heartache is. And if you can take all that in and process it, it gives you a certain sensitivity that you need. It's like when you go to the doctor, um, I mean, how do I put this? Uh, I recently went to the doctor for, for an exam and it was a rectal exam. And the doctor told me to bend over. I'd never had an examination like this before. And he just, you know, he's so used to dealing with people who don't have this kind of procedure that he did it really quickly. And it kind of shocked me. I mean, would it have been better if he held my hand and said, don't worry, this isn't gonna hurt? Or was it better for him to just go in and, and do what he had to do, right? He could probably read that he would be uncomfortable with it. So you have to go in, in my, opinion it's not about surprising people you've got to go into it with a certain level of sensitivity uh, to their circumstance and so when you do the research and you learn about these people you have a level of empathy you have a level of contempt there could be a broad range of emotions you have but you have to be able to process all of that in advance of speaking with this individual it's not like being at a party where you're meeting someone for the first time and you're just talking to them you have an advantage in that you have the ability to do research. I mean, again, we can go to a party and talk to people. I don't typically, I'm the guy at the party who's not talking, but if we wind up talking and I, I hear some interesting things, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask because, not because I'm nosy, but because I'm interested. This is not information I wanna share, it's information for myself. How, let me ask you a process question. <clears throat> When you're sitting and you're doing an interview, you got, you landed somebody. You're you're doing an interview. How have you figured out, or have you figured out, from how how have you been able to start constructing film, even as you're sitting doing interviews? Is it a process of you do all your interviews, you do all your research, you stop shooting, and then you start thinking about the film, or does is it as you're interviewing people, the film starts coming together in your head and you start to get a sense of these are the questions I want to ask. Either these are where the storylines are going. It's a, it's a combination because first you, you do the research to a point where, okay, I know this is what the film is. Like based on my research, if I ask these questions, I'm going to get this outcome. But it never is that. Can, can you use Wu Tang as an example? Can you like walk us through like, when you guys initially thought about Wu Tang, and then as and then as post to illustrate this, yeah, I mean, I knew that I wanted to make something that went beyond just the music because, again, being you know, hip hop is a reflection of and a reaction to the environment, and so many people make these films about a rapper and music, but you don't get into the environment. So I knew I wanted to do something that got into the environment. I didn't know to what extent the racism on Staten Island that they had to deal with, I, I had no idea. And I didn't learn more until we could be archival. You know, we stumbled upon this guy, a father and son team who were kind of their own news agency and have thousands of tapes of Staten Island history that no one even knows about. And when you see these protests and all these really racist things, like it just opens more doors. So like, you know, there was a card that said Staten, race on Staten Island, you know, what was that like? And then when you see what it was like it's on the archival, it just opens up. So I had the privilege of seeing that archival in advance of the interview. And then it turns out one of the kids from a local news report about it, Rizzo was like, I know that kid, I went to school with him. You know what I mean? So it's like, the research is important. You do your research, you plot it out based on the research, but because it's a documentary and because they're rabbit holes, it opens up all kinds of doors. So you do the research, you do the planning, and then you have your eyes and ears open for how things are going to change when you're in the process of learning. And we interviewed Riza's brother. You know, Riza's brother, Divine, is sort of the business mastermind. He had never been interviewed by anybody, really. And when you learn his perspective on it, it's like, you know, this guy goes, I didn't know anything about computers. And then three months later, I'm a master of QuickBooks and this and this and that. Like, who's a master of computers in three years, in three months? And what does that really mean? Well, that speaks to some guys have issues with the books. 
some guys in the group have complaints about not getting money. So on one hand, you have a guy who's a brilliant business mind who also says, I learned all this stuff in three months. And then you have these brilliant artists who are saying, he's my guy and everything, but he owes me money. I don't have access to their bank accounts. What's the truth? You decide what the truth is. And so the more information you have, the better prepared you are to plan what you want to do. But then it always changes because it's a documentary. It's not a script. It's not, you know what's going to happen from page to page. You know what the end of the film is. With documentaries, you've got to be open to a surprise end. What what discoveries did you make in of Mike's and Men in post that you kind of didn't think was going to be a through line while you were shooting or in pre-production? Um, you know, this is also predicated on archival, like the old Dirty Bastard story. Like, I didn't know how deep we're going to be able to go into it based on the archival. I mean... The rapport that RZA and ODB have is undeniable, but towards the end of Dirty's life, we had footage of him in the studio with RZA, and Dirty's bloated and missing teeth, and he's like not what he used to be, he's super paranoid. You know, that whole thing in the film, I didn't realize what a big role it was going to play, and that, again, was predicated on great interviews, but also archival to help tell the story. So the, 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 the through line of family, right? Wu-Tang Clan, Clan means family, and RZA and ODB were actual family, blood. And, you know, RZA says in the film, the dream started with me and him, you know, looking up at the stars together. You know, we shared the dream to look at how both of their lives had progressed. You know, Old Dirty was in prison. RZA's becoming super successful as a producer, a director, an actor. ODB gets out of prison and then just never is able to come back. The dream was their dream to have together. And then when that partner in, in that dream dies, you know, what does that mean to RZA? You know, RZA hadn't seen the series until it was, he didn't see it until it was done. And I screened it for him, and that was the one episode I was like, I'm not going to stay in the room with him because I don't know what's going to happen. And he was, you know, he was choked up. And he said, you know, there are things in this film I would do differently if it was totally up to me, but I understand why you're doing it. And I think that you're giving all the guys a fair shake so they can't accuse me of not giving them a fair shake, so you have my blessing. But I knew it could have gone, it could have gone another way where he was really pissed off. But uh, that family dynamic, I think, not all of them are blood. Some of them are, you know, how that played out in the last mm -hmm. film is, is, is to me the big payoff. What instinct do you have to resist pissing off the subject matter and saying this is what's best for the film? But how, like, how do you walk that line? It's journalism. So I think as long as it's fair and balanced and RZA and his brother had a fair shake, Every, everyone has the opportunity to um, have a fair shake. So as long as I'm being fair and it's not one-sided, it, nothing's off the table. Like you're saying fair and you're saying journalism sort of like not in a vacuum, but in a new environment, like what was considered the old rules of journalism aren't necessarily where young people are today who are doing blogs and who interview people. And I mean, you've been, you've probably been interviewed by, by people in blogs and I'm sure you've been appalled by the way those interviews are conducted compared to the way you would have done things. So when you say fairness and you're talking about these sort of ideas and notions that you have in your head, can you kind of delve into that a little bit more in detail? It's it's just um, it's balance. I mean, if you watch M if you watch MSNBC, there is a perspective. If you watch Fox News, there's a perspective. To me, there's got to be somewhere in the middle where there's balance. Like, I'm, I have no issue with MSNBC. I'm, I'm more in line with what they're talking about. Not at all in line with what the Fox is talking about. But you get to this point where Everyone is just projecting. There's some news and there's some facts, but they're projecting their agenda, right? And I think the way to counter that 
is to have both sides of the coin. Like I couldn't, I couldn't imagine making a film where it was like, this person is bad, 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 and that's it. There's got to be more people are more nuanced than that, and um, it's dangerous. You know, when I was an editor of Vibe magazine first position I had was the front of the book section, which was called Start. Start had little news bits. This is printed magazines. People would laugh at this now. And so I would have 10 news stories that I'd have to edit, write, whatever. And I did a fake news story about Idi Amin uh, getting released from prison or coming out of exile and doing a rap record. Now, that's ridiculous. And when I wrote it, the, the, the lawyers at Vibe at first had an issue with it. And I said, no, it's satire. It's ridiculous. Who's going to believe this? So it went through. And I get a call from Edie Amin's biographer. Who's like, hey, how's Edie? You know what I mean? He's like, yo, how's my man Edie? Is he all right? Like, when's the album coming out? And I'm like, you wrote the book on Edie Amin. And you're legitimately asking me if he's got a rap album? So that was my experience with fake news in the 90s, but it was a joke. I wasn't, there was no agenda besides laughs. So you see where we are now, where people have agendas that are evil. Um, and it's scary to me that so many people fall into this void of information that's so one-sided. It's because it's just what, what, what people want to hear. And I think real fans of documentary it's not about what they want to hear. It's about what the subject has to say and what their lives say. So I don't even know if I answered your question again, but that's kind of. You, I mean, you did answer a question, but it, it, it sort of, to me, opens up a new sort of through line is how do we determine, how does a young filmmaker now determine um, their objectivity, right? Like we're influenced we're sort of influenced by this very specific environment that we're in now. And how does a young filmmaker sort of have a North Star of objectivity? While still, like you said, having their unique perspective. I mean, obviously you believe that you kind of hold that line. You bring a piece of yourself, you bring a piece of your history, your participation in a specific culture and subject matter, but you're also holding on there's a north star there's a there's a objectivity to what you're trying to present you're trying to present all sides how does a young person how's a young di director kind of identify those things that help them figure that out before they get to a project i mean if you as a filmmaker don't understand that objectivity is your duty then you shouldn't be making documentary films that simple. I mean, it's a, it's an oath. It's like um, you owe the truth to the people. Like, it's dangerous that people don't have that same sense of urgency when it comes to balance and, and journalism. I mean, the president has done an amazing job of dismantling how the public feels about. I mean. Anytime you say anything about the guy, he points at you and says fake news. I mean, now people are drinking Clorox because he said it, it could work for you. I mean, I think people rely too much on the internet and social media and are too reactionary without, as you said, you know, the facts, without doing the research, without having trusted sources. And so at a time when there aren't any trusted sources, you've got to trust in yourself. And so I try my best that it's never perfect, um, but um, it's important. It's really important to have that balance or else, I mean, I'm just doing my part. I can't really speak for young filmmakers. I mean, maybe the style now is the facts don't matter. Maybe that's where it is. That's not, I'm from a different time, I guess. I mean, I think you are, and yet the work that you're making is, quickly becoming timeless. So it's still sort of, I think it still sort of anchors what young filmmakers can sort of link themselves to 
Um, but I think it's this this notion of objectivity and this notion of facts, I think, is sort of important for filmmakers like yourself to kind of express in bare terms because we're we're in such a murky space. Um, and the medium has changed so rapidly. You know what I mean? Like like I said, like what you know what blogs are, you know, aren't really considered journalism and, and bloggers don't feel the need to always present truth and facts necessarily. Like they don't they don't see that as their modus operandi necessarily sometimes. <laughs> but like magazines and journalism and newspaper journalism, it's it's completely collapsed. Going back to what I said about Greg Tate when he told me you know, you need an editor. And I was like, you know, screw you, old man. Once I had the experience with real editors, I was like, yo, he was so right. These bloggers have no experience with an editor. It's like, I know what I'm saying. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say what I want. But it's like an editor is, a, is an additional voice, an additional opinion. Another voice that says, you sure you want to think of, you sure you don't want to rethink that? Or what did you mean when you said this here? Can you clarify this? Um, these these folks don't have that experience. So there was a time when I was getting four dollars a word, and when, you know five dollars a word in some cases. And then when things got down to like ten cents a word, I was like, why would I do that? Why am I gonna get paid ten cents a word? And so you have a culture where ten cents a word is a big deal, and then people write for nothing, and then you can't afford to pay for an editor, and then. It's just a free for all, which is what the internet is. It's a free for all. That's fake news. That's not true. I'm telling you, this is what happened, and people either buy into it or they don't. In in the sort of vein of collaboration, which you said about an editor, editor, talk about collaboration in terms of filmmaking. Um, your pre-production collaborators, specifically your researchers that you work for, that you work with, I should say for. Um, working on set specifically in interviewing the subjects, you know, so obviously people like myself, cinematographers, um, other producers on set with you, kind of helping you shape whatever questions and whatever space you were in with the subject. And then in post-production, again, back to archival, back to editing. Talk about what, what are the tools that documentary filmmakers have in terms of their collaborators? I mean, you've got to be open to who you're working with. Like, I don't know the latest cameras or filters, and I actually don't want to know. I want to work with you because this is what you do. You're an expert, and you can help me refine my vision, or you might have a vision that's great. Um, for me, it's not about knowing everything. It's about being on a team of people who do know who can help enhance what your vision is. So, um, Again, Hans is, 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 has a great eye, he's a great cinematographer. I'm going to lean on Hans for what his opinion is. Um, with the research, I give some direction, and they have a sense of what it is that I want to know, and so they do the research, and then we go back and forth, and I say, let's do more of that, or I'll come with some research. So for me, it's, it's you know, at the end of the day, I'm the director, and my name is going to say director, but... There are lots of other people who have credit, and it's not just about me. I have a, a point of view and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, an aesthetic based on kind of how I operate, but you have to be flexible, too. You have to be able to know who's talented, who, who can really help bring your vision to the forefront, and that develops over years. You know, you work on lots of projects. I mean, you worked on this thing with Ed Sullivan. With yeah. Bill. Right? All of a sudden, I'm pulled into an Ed Sullivan thing, and then your name comes up. I'm like, what? You know what I mean? And then it turns out that Jason Pollard was the editor on that. Mm. So it's like, all this comes through, well, I know them. I know Hans, and I know Pollard because they're players in the game, and I actually work with them. You know what I mean? So it's it's a small enough community, and you do enough work and you work with lots of different people here and there and you, you, you build a base of people that you trust, who you like, who do good work, who have a similar vision, you know, and, and you just continue on with that. And it's funny because you said the, the later part of my career, I mean, I'm, I'm no spring chicken, but like I've only been directing films for five years. So for me, 
I feel like I'm actually at the beginning of my career in terms of uh, being a filmmaker. But as you said, the, 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 the through line or the connection to journalism, it's, you know, people have asked me, was it hard to make the transition? I'm like, no. No, yeah, yeah. And that's why podcasts, like podcasts is just in between directing a film and writing an article. It's just an article where you hear shit. It's like, to me, I've been doing this for, 30, for a long time. So it wasn't that hard of a transition for me. It felt very natural. As an observer, it didn't feel like, I didn't feel like I was sitting next to a rookie filmmaker. And for me, as an observer, I knew, because I knew about your background as a journalist, and I felt like you were doing, you were doing, in terms of Wu-Tang, you were doing the thing that you wanted to do. Like, this, this is something you were curious about. And knowing that you were from New York, I never questioned how, how good you were going to make certain things because of that, that natural through line. I'm like, well, he's a journalist. Like, journal like you don't survive that long in journalism and you're hack. <laughs> right, right. So I don't expect the film to be hacked because I think there were links that maybe even journalists at the time didn't realize there were links between long form journalism and documentary filmmaking that, that, that they, they're simpatico, they speak to each other. Um, I'm going to take in a question from some of our audience members. Um, Kyle asks, what hip hop project or other piece of art has influenced your style when it comes to filmmaking? Um, well, I just think the graffiti overall, because it's a mystery, right? When you think about it, like you grew up in New York City, you see a name on a wall, right? I didn't see who did it. I've only heard rumors about who this person is, what they look like. So you see a name on a wall and you start, your mind starts to work. Okay, he's from the Bronx, he's Puerto Rican, he's about five foot five, based on where how high the name is. But, mm. but people would walk around with milk crates and stand on milk crates so they could be higher when they wrote their names. So when you finally met someone, this is before cell phones or pagers. You you finally meet someone and you're like, you're not who I thought you were gonna be. Or you are who I thought you're gonna be, and even more extreme. So the, the mystery of who these people are, what their story, you make up stories about them because some guys are infamous for stealing spray paint, others for beating other people up. You hear all this, all this folklore. And so then you start to in your mind create this folklore about an individual. And so I've been doing that since I was a kid. And, and so until you meet this person, it's almost like a documentary in and of itself. You're researching, you're, you're talking to people, you're trying to get to this person that you admire and you want to respect, and you finally have them. And then me, I'm going to ask questions. I'm like, yo, that's you? Like, when did you start? What's your story? So I would say that my involvement in the world of graffiti pushed me to um, publish a magazine, which led to everything else that I did. You know, I went to my mom, who didn't have a lot of money at 17 and said, I want, I need a thousand dollars to make a magazine. And she put together the money, and gave it to me. If she didn't do that, if I wasn't interested in graffiti and really pushed to sort of make the conversation better around it, then I wouldn't, none of this would be happening right now. I want to ask a question that's less uh, filmmaking process and career themed overall. You seem to be the kind of person who has taken the path less walk, almost in everything that you've done. You've, you've just taken the path that nobody else has taken. You kind of figured out a thing. You, you seem to be all things and nothing at the same time. Is that a product of what's happening outside of you, or is that an internal driven thing? Is that something, is that a psychology? Is that something I'd ask your therapist? Or is that something I'd ask an anthropologist? Well, when you say nothing at the same time, what do you mean by that? Um, because you're, you- Nothing, Hans? No. <laughs> 
It's a good question because you're moving. It's not like, okay, you know, like Rakim has been a rapper for the last 40 years. Rakim has not tried to become a fashion designer. He's not trying to become a filmmaker. He's not trying to become a motivational speaker. We know rappers that have become college professors. He's decided to do this one thing and this one thing only. You have jumped into so many different spaces. You know what I'm saying? Like, are you doing graffiti today? You know what I'm saying? You're not, you're not writing graffiti today. You've moved on to these other spaces. I, I don't mean nothing as you're not those things, but you're evolving. You've evolved past the thing you started. I mean, if you don't have a writer, you were, you went and taxed, you know, you went and tag walls. You told me stories of snatching paint and going to tag, you know, you like, you've done that. Like you live that life. And yet that's not what you're doing today. Right. You're far from that. So there is a thing. There is a thing that either I have to talk to ask your therapist or an anthropologist to study where you are from. Are other people around you like this? Or is there something internal? Well, I think, I think words are powerful. Right. And at a young age, we call ourselves writers. Why? Mm -hmm. We're just writing on things, right? So if you think about the fact that I've been calling myself a writer since I was like nine years old, the power in that. When you think about the fact that my father was a filmmaker and producer and he died when I was really young and I wind up doing the same thing, there's power in sort of knowing that there's something greater that motivates you. So I um I think about a lot of people who were writers when I was a writer for magazines and I don't know where most of those people are now. When I got my fellowship to the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia right around 9-11 to, into 2000, I was in there with 13 other folks who were the New York Times theater critic, the jazz critic, people who were way more educated than me, much lighter in skin tone than me. Um, more social capital than me. Around 2001, those folks started calling me because I started to transition into television, asking me if I had work. And I'm like, wait, you're a theater critic at the Times. Like, you're calling me? So my ability to adapt is just like the ability to adapt in the wild. If I didn't adapt, if I was still a music journalist, no one cares about music journalism anymore. There are a few coveted spots if you're at the Times here and there, but like I couldn't make a living as a music journalist, you know? So I think a lot of it is just survival and also boredom. I get bored really easily. And um, if I'm not, if I'm not, that goes back to being a participant. Sorry, that goes back to being a participant. I, if I feel, I feel like I'm not like I was painting for a while, as in having gallery exhibitions, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I was pretty at for about three or four years. I was really active. And I put together art shows with some of my friends who are way more who have been doing it for years and years. And I did a show where I did painting with like 10 different artists who are well known, pretty smart way to get in the game. Um, and I sold paintings and then I just started to feel like here I have my friends who do this, who have suffered for this, who make, you know, um, and who am I? I'm just kind of coming out of the woodwork. So I just decided that now my sort of artistic expression is music. And um, the music business isn't what it is anymore. But I do it because I like the uh, being in a band and the collaborative nature of it and live performance is cool, although I don't know where live performance is going to be now that the world is upside down. Um, but I can't be all things to all people. I can only be who I am based on what I'm interested in. And I always try to pursue my interests. And I always like to have a hands on experience with what I'm interested in. So I was interested in graffiti. I wrote graffiti. I did a magazine about it. I was interested in hip hop. I didn't have a good voice to be a rapper. I understood it. I did a hip hop magazine. Um, I would do books about hip hop. I would do books about graffiti. So everything kind of feeds off of itself and has fed into the larger projects I've done. 
Jumping on that theme, but there also seems to be <clears throat> part of. I think what I'm getting at is you, for example, you, you didn't you didn't go off to college at 18. I mean, you're a brilliant person, you're a verbose person, you're a well written person, um, and yet you get an opportunity to do a fellowship. Um, you didn't go to film school, and yet I'm sure you had contemporaries that you're making, you have more film deals and more filmmaking experience now than some people who did go to film school. So there is a thing about you figuring out your timing for certain things. Is that just the boredom? Or is that is there something that you, you, you get bored because you see the next thing coming? Like, how did you figure out that MTV was gonna be the thing before established journalists did? I'm I'm interested in education, but I'm not interested in traditional education. It doesn't engage me. So being hands on and trying to physically do these things, that's kind of how I learned. Um, you know, when I went to Columbia, I got to take a film course and we had to direct these films. And I directed a short. And we all had to present our films. And I presented my film, and the professor says, what do you guys all think of this? You know, oh, I think he's trying to say this. I think he's trying to say that. He says, you, want, you guys want to know what I think? I think this is the worst fucking piece of shit I've ever seen. This is fucking disrespectful. How dare you even? And I'm just sitting there like, and he knows that he can't fail me because I'm a fellowship person. and." Um, he really went in on me and said it was the worst piece of shit ever, the most disrespectful uh, display of filmmaking and you know, older white guy. And I just sat there and I just looked around and everyone just couldn't believe it. And I just never went back to that class. Um, so for me, maybe, you know, maybe my film really was bad. It's entirely possible but not that bad. And I realized at that moment that the only way I'm gonna get opportunities is, is, if, is if I create them for myself. Mm -hmm. And I created opportunities for myself by publishing a magazine, by doing this, by doing. That's the only way I was gonna get any opportunities because I didn't have a traditional um, education. I didn't have the social capital. The funny thing is, um, Stan Latham, you know, you know, he is big. Yeah. Yeah. Producer. Producer. Yeah. He was a contemporary of my father's and he was a fan of one of my books. So CAA lined up a meeting with me and Stan Latham. And he's looking at me. He's like, you look familiar. I'm like, yeah, did you know Horace Jenkins? He's like, yeah, I knew that N word. I was like, well, that N word was my father. And he said, well, how did you get into film and TV? And I said, it wasn't because his N words put me on. You know, so the other thing you got to know is when a door opens, you got to run through it. You know, it's time and place. Um, and I think I've been able to recognize being at the right place at the right time and sort of capitalizing on that moment. And the more you do, the more people believe in you. You know, when I did my first little graffiti black and white magazine, I told people I was going to do it. No one believed me. I did it. So then when I wanted to do something else, I was able to enlist more people to help me do what I wanted to do. And it's the same with filmmaking. If you're an independent filmmaker and other people in your independent filmmaking community see that you do stuff, they're going to want to help you because you are doing great work. You know how to achieve things because not everyone wants to go get her. And it helps them figure out what they want to do. So the more that you can be self-motivated and actually do things, especially now in this cyber world where people take photos of, you know, things that seemingly look cool but don't mean anything in real life, if you actually can do things in real life, that's where the value is. And that's what's going to separate you from everyone else. And I tell people all the time, if I was just a kid 10 years ago who had a graffiti blog, nobody would care. I did my graffiti magazine when there were three in the entire world. That's what made me special and stand out. And that's why, because I was into what I was into, at my age now, 
I look at culture as language. So I'm fluent in a lot of language, cultural language, and that's why I can relate to some of the kids that I work with. Um, I can at least understand where they're coming from, even if I don't like the music they make. I understand where it comes from. I understand if you look at a rapper like 6 9 he's got gold teeth, he's got multicolored hair, he's got sagging jeans, so he's hip-hop, punk rock, high fashion, all at the same time. I understand that. It's not for me, but I understand why it's for the kids. And so that kind of gives me the parlance necessary to sort of feel like I'm just getting my start in uh, a lot of these conversations with film, and I hope to continue doing that. I mean, I think I'll punctuate that point with saying it seems like your career is very punk rock. You just kind of are very hip hop. You just did it. You didn't wait for permission. You didn't wait until it was popular. You just were like, I'm going to just do it. You're not going to wait for anybody to say anything. It, it, it feels like a very sort of, in terms of ethos, a very punk career to me. Well, I mean, you've got you've to have gatekeepers, though, who give you opportunities. Um, you can do it to a certain extent. I can make my underground magazine, but eventually there are people who are gatekeepers who can give you the tools you need to speak to way more people. So, I mean, if I was really punk rock, I'd still be making zines. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm more punk pop. I'm more Green Day than I have dead Kennedys at this point. I'm going to take another question from the audience. Um, Alicia asks, how does your experience as a producer of documentaries differ from the impact your role as a director, what drives you to produce the work that you produce? So, do you consider do you do you feel like you produce the work that you do? Like, let's say the last two projects you work on, are you hiring producers or are you sort of actively producing yourself? It's a little of both. I mean, I hire producers. Um, I'm heavily involved in booking the talent and thinking about who we should get, and a lot of those resources come out of my Rolodex. So. Filmmaking also boils down to taste. Like anyone who's watching this could have made Fresh Dress, but you're going to make it different from me. And maybe you would have made it better than me. Or maybe there are tangents that are more interesting to you that I wouldn't find interesting. So to me, it all boils down to taste. What is your taste? And I think the, the consistency in what I do is my taste. And so in order to sort of if I'm involved and people want me involved, then you know, getting my taste in the mix involves my resources and, and how I approach things. But as a producer, I'm ultimately serving the director and what the director's vision is. So um, there's a film that uh, actually my wife just directed call, called La Madrina, The Savage Life of Lorene Padilla. And Lorene is a former gang member from the South Bronx who went from burning down buildings in the 60s and 70s to becoming a community activist. And I was a director on that film. I mean, excuse me, I was the producer on that film. And, um, you know, Raquel has a very uh, clear vision for what she wanted. And, and my job was to serve that vision. Um, Brian asked, what is one moment in your filmmaking career where you took a risk and it paid off? I mean, not much of a risk, but my agent told me that RZA was ready to do the Wu-Tang story, but, I, you know, you've got to pitch it to him. So I flew to California from New York and flew back the same day. I literally flew out to pitch him and flew back. I didn't know how it was going to go. And he told me, look, man, you know, I've known RZA for years. He said, look, Ron Howard wants to do it. And I said, look, Ron Howard would be great, but he's not going to do what I'm going to do. But if you want to do Ron Howard... I wish you the best of luck. And so I did my best to pitch, and I didn't hear back from him for a couple of weeks, but um, I've been fortunate. You know, I've, most of my films have been funded, uh, whether it was CNN films or the stuff I've done for Showtime. Um, you know, I'm a semi-bankable documentary director in New York City, a black woman at that. So um, I've been fortunate. Um, most people who make documentaries don't always have their docs funded. They start out independently and then eventually get money to finish. I've had the great fortune of having these projects fully funded out of the gate. And that's not, that's not normal 
And I don't know how long that's going to continue, but for now, that's how it's worked out. What is a dream project for you right now? Um, I'm, I'm up for a Louis Armstrong documentary. And uh, I looked at the archival, and it's just uh, it's who this guy was, who he is. It's pretty mind blowing. I mean, he was the most famous person in the world at one point. And uh, he's also, he, he spent a lot of his life in Queens, not far from me. Yeah. Um, I've always wanted, to do, always wanted to do a film about Neil Young. I'm a huge Neil Young fan. Um, there's a lot, a lot of stuff I'd really like to do, but I think that right now I've got a good rhythm in sort of the stories I've been able to tell. And, um, you know, when you, when you look at the work as a whole, I think it tells a, a larger story um, about Black folks in America. And uh, I'm happy to sort of continue along that path. Um, thematically, there seems to be a lot of work about Black culture, specifically Black men. Um, if you're talking about, you know, Louis Armstrong, you talk about Wu-Tang Clan. Um, is, is that sort of a theme for you or is it just happen? It just so happens what you're attracted to. I mean, you talk about doing something with Neil Young, so that's not necessarily a, yeah, I mean, a, a yeah. male, but. <clears throat> I was up for a documentary about women in hip hop, but I shouldn't be the guy doing that. I think that there are women who should be telling that story. Um, so I'm not saying I'm not capable of making a film, about women, but I also believe that women should also have the opportunity to lead that charge. And that's what has been cool about what I've been able to do for a long time. People who didn't look like me were the ones telling these stories. And even I don't always get it all the way right, but I'm going to get it a little bit closer to what we'd like than someone else might. So um, can I ask you, what is that? Like, okay. <laughs> That's a debate in filmmaking and sort of, um, I don't want to use the esoteric word, cultural anthropology. By that, I mean just people documenting culture, culture they're interested, in, whether it's sneakers, sports, um, you know. Here's, here's, here's what I'll say. I'll say it's easier, it's easy for me, it's easier for me to make a film about white America than it is for white America to make a film about me. Why is that? Because we grew up on the Waltons. We grew up on white popular culture. We've had uh, extensive history lessons about the white perspective on how America was built. So I know and understand, I think, um, a bit of what the motivations are, what the goals are, what the end result is. I think I'm, I'm, an, I'm, I think folks of color in America who have been raised on popular culture and just the politics of the land are more qualified to make films about white people than, than the reverse. And that is to say, I'm not saying that white people can't make fresh dress. I'm not saying that white people can't do a Wu-Tang film. I'm saying that white people traditionally have had the opportunity to make those films. And I think it's important that Native people, every once in a while, get to tell their story. And I think that that's the difference between me and someone else doing Wu-Tang. I'm not approaching them as if they're exotics. I'm approaching them as if they are my contemporaries. I'm approaching mm. them as people that I understand firsthand. There aren't any assumptions from my perspective on why Ghostface Killer might have been a thief for a couple of years. I understand why, and it's based on my experiences, and those experiences inform my eye. And, if, you know, that goes to what I'm saying about, you know, how white America has been portrayed in popular culture through film and television. It, it goes to who has been in control of those decisions and who creates those opportunities and who gets to make those things. And based on the work that those folks have done, I feel like I've got a great education on what it is 
it would take to make a great film. Neil Young, I'm a fan. He's actually Canadian, although he just got his American citizenship. <clears throat> I'm a fan of his work. I understand the Americana sort of connection to what it is that he does. I'd love to make that film. Will I get the opportunity to make that film? I don't know, but someone, a white director, would has a better chance of making a Wu-Tang film than a black director does making a Neil Young film. And that's just the nature of the business. I mean, there are way more white people in positions of power. It's not even per it's not even always personal. It's just if your Rolodex is these people, you tend to hire the people that you know. Most humans don't always go beyond the scope of what they know. So it's it's not always just racism, but racism creates a system where it's it's easy to get lost. And it's easy for people to get lazy and not give a broader range of people opportunities. Let me ask you to put on your futurist hat. You've been making movies for five years. You, you kind of consider that the, the latest iteration of your career as, a, as expressing your voice in this world. <clears throat> Where do you see it going? The goal is to branch off into narrative, and I think me, by me demonstrating that I have a, a firm handle on a broad range of topics, that puts me in a better position as a, a writer and director to sort of give people the confidence in my ability to tell stories in a narrative sense. Uh, that's one of my goals, but I never really have a plan. I have a plan now because I'm a grown ass man and I have kids and responsibilities, but I always lead with what my interests are. And I've been fortunate that my interests have sort of coincided with being paid for my interests. Uh, the way the world is right now, who knows? You know, um, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I mean, the whole business is being hit pretty hard. And even if I wanted to shoot something, I could at the moment. So where it's going to go, I don't know. But it goes back to what I said about seeing open doors and running through them. Anytime I see a door open that I'm interested in, I'm going to run through it and see what happens. So we'll see where it leads me. I mean, I've been curating art shows. I'm interested in that. But like curating art shows now, who's going to go to an art show? Not for a couple, like, until there's a vaccine. You know, my band was supposed to open for Metallica in October in Sacramento. I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, so I, um, the doors open and I run through the doors as they open. Has your other artistic uh, endeavors fed your filmmaking or inform your filmmaking at all? Yeah, I mean, having, you know, when you... I mean, I'm certainly not Wu Tang Clan, but I didn't know what, else, what your other like. When you talk about your band, can you tell the audience like a little bit? Like, what do you? What else do you? What is it that you're referring to? The band is called the 1865, as in the year, and we know so-called Emancipation Proclamation happened then. And my whole philosophy with that is, or band philosophy is that not much has changed. You know, we're still dealing with a lot of the same sort of silliness. You might have to. We're still dealing with the same kind of silliness uh, that we were dealing with back then. Um, so the music, it's an all black punk band, or I don't want to say it's punk, it's a rock band. Uh, uh, the woman on vocals. And, um, you know, we make music that kind of speaks to having a conversation around using the past as a way to sort of talk about what's happening now, because really, it's um, not much has changed, you know? So that's the other thing. I always try to use my platform to say something about what I feel is important. Um, and is that, is that in like in this time of like a sort of like in suspended animation, is, is music another outlet for you? Like, how is it? <clears throat> How does it play in your overall sort of artistic life? 
I mean, it's an out, it's an outlet. It's another way to collaborate with people, and it's um, it's great when you have an idea, like you have a sketch for a song, and then you share it with people, and then everyone adds on to it, and be, it comes to life. It's it's one of the most direct ways I've been able to sort of have an idea and see it turn into something I really like that I'm proud of. So it it, it just helps with getting goals, setting goals, and and achieve what you want based on a very pat agenda. Do you find that your sort of even like having an identity as a musician, does it help does it help relate to you? Do you it does it help you relate when you're interviewing other musicians, when you're interviewing rappers or singers? Is there a through line? Is there a connection? Is there a language that you speak that makes them more comfortable? Well, I don't I don't really mention that I'm a musician, but there's just I'm gonna know the questions to ask. I'm gonna avoid certain questions because I kind of know what the answer is gonna be. And I'm gonna be able to sort of think about things that are gonna be interesting to the in who's being interviewed. Like that's the other thing. Like whoever you're interviewing, you've got to make it interesting for them or else it's just a job. When you can make it so it's a conversation that they enjoy, it turns into a whole, the outcome is completely different. And how are you doing that? How are you, how are you making somebody, because I, I think I've witnessed this, you, you seem to, when you sit down in the interview chair, and I've seen subjects, they're sort of nervous, there's lights, um, there's social media, so people don't want to be portrayed in a way that makes them look bad. How do you turn that space into like just a one on one space? Like I've seen you do it. Like people, they forget everything that's around them. And I've well, seen other like, people do it as well. Like, how was it? What's your method? It's it's eye contact, it's 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 listening. And it's that's the trick. Once someone realizes that you're listening to them and you're engaging them in a way that demonstrates that you're listening, everything else disappears. No one really knows what's going on around them. They 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 drop their guard because someone's Everyone want, just wants to be listened to. It's a human instinct. You want to be listened to. So if you can demonstrate that you're listening to someone, everything else goes out the window. So. I want to just jump back to um, something I find curious. Besides the fact that he was like super famous, what else kind of interests you about Louis Armstrong? Because I don't think people, I don't think even the person, the young person today really has a sense of who Louis Armstrong Armstrong was. What's interesting to you about him? Well, obviously his music contribution. I mean, he was jazz. I mean, he all that he innovated is still relevant today and still his impact, his influence is still alive. But being a black man at the he was an ambassador for the United States and you have bombings in Little Rock, Arkansas happening, and he's got to go to Russia and represent the United States. I mean, he was in so many unique positions as a black man. At that time, you know, he was the exception in so many instances. And so while all these horrible things were happening to his people, he's got to reconcile the fact that he's the exception. And he's not and he's not happy about it, but then he's got a soldier on. So very complicated, nuanced guy. And I think unpacking who he was can cover a lot of ground in terms of people understanding race in, in this country. Like I felt like um Miles Davis had a quote, something I'm paraphrasing, where he kind of said, like, he doesn't smile like Louis Armstrong. Right. Like, he kind of poo pooed the way Louis seemed to be accessible to people, and Miles sort of made himself inaccessible. Right. What, like, and I feel like Louis has sort of become, and I don't want to get into a too deep discussion, but Louis sort of become an icon for black accessibility without accountability, right? Like to me, if you don't know Louis and you just knew him casually, that's what he would represent. Have you seen that in the culture and, and is yeah, part yeah. of it? People have made that argument and it's valid. There are things about, but you know, Miles Davis was an upper middle class kid. It was, you know, Louis Armstrong was born at the turn of the century and had to walk barefoot and perform in the street for pennies. Miles and Louis Armstrong have two different experiences as black men. That's why the, 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 the self-esteem that Miles Davis had is what fueled him. 
that's what gave him an edge. That's what gave him the arrogance that he had, or not even arrogance. It just made him an American. It made him an equal in ways that Louis Armstrong wasn't. You know, his manager's calling him the underer. I mean, you're dealing with the guy who's seen people who have been lynched. You know, so his his approach to being black in America is going to be different from the generations before him, but it doesn't mean that he wasn't woke. I mean, there are things that he did that um, were conscious, but there were things that he did that weren't. And the fact that he was always smiling, you know, and had bug, bugged eyes, you know, that can be problematic. But you might also look at the fact that the way he sang was kind of through his teeth. He wasn't always necessarily smiling. It was a, it was the byproduct of his vocal style. So these are the kinds of things that I would want to explore um, in 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 a film about his life. And you said you've you've lived uh you live not too far from where you grew up, not too far where where his house is, which is now yeah. museum. Yep. Corona. I grew up in a story. The, the museum's in Corona. A beautiful house. I've been there. I got a chance to shoot there before. It's kind of amazing. Um, so that's curious. Um, I want to open up the room to questions. So um, a few people have uh, posted their questions, but if you want to ask your question directly or you want to post it in chat, um, just give me a signal and I'll point you out. So I'm going to open the room to questions. Is there anything else you kind of want to add while we're waiting for that, Sasha? Any thoughts you have? No, I think it's. I, um, I, I'm I'm flattered that folks want to hear what I have to say, and and I think it's a great time to sort of rethink how you want to approach your art, and um, it's a great time to sort of dive into whatever it is you really want to do, and take this time to focus in on where you want to go. Somebody asked the question: What do you do to sharpen your writing on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, for me, listening to music does a lot for my writing. Um, I try to listen to new stuff or go back to things that I haven't listened to a long time that can bring me back to a time and place that I have fond memories or, or difficult memories. Um, you know, lyrics really inform me at times. So I, I really look to music. Uh, you know, I couldn't make it as a rapper, but I think I've got better bars than most rappers. And I think that sort of competitive nature that hip hop reads, I just try to apply that to my writing. Competing with myself, not really anybody else. Um, somebody asked, do you maintain relationship relationships with subjects after your films have been exhibited or distributed? If so, or if not, what do these relationships look like? Um, it, it, they're usually cordial. I don't necessarily go to brunch with people or anything like that, but it, it pays to be cordial. And um, wait, hold on, come on in, come in, come in. It pays. It pays. It pays to be cordial, and um, those relationships wind up becoming beneficial down the road. And you get phone calls from people who recommend who were recommended by some of the people that you made the films about. Um, Ghostface Killer has a brother who did 25 years for something he insists that he didn't do, and there's all this new information in, about his case. So his brother called me and said, hey, you know, um, I want to talk to you about my story in Staten Island, and police and racism. And so um, I don't talk to Ghostface Killer all the time, but he has my number and he calls me on occasion. So um, I think it's, 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 I try to have the journalism approach and have that kind of balance. I mean, sometimes you become friends with folks, but I try to keep a level, maintain a level of distance. I have a question. What's what's a horror story that you've had? A horror story in terms of filmmaking? Like, what's a what was like a bad day? Well, there there are some bad executives. Um, there's a whole really layered thing that I'm dealing with right now. Um, but there are bad executives who fear for their jobs and don't make the best decisions. And they make their decisions out of fear. 
And um, sometimes it's hard to navigate that. I've been fortunate in having someone like Vinny at Showtime who's been a champion of my work, but not everyone's Vinny. And um, you've got to learn how to navigate uh, these folks and they can definitely rain on your parade sometimes. But I haven't had any horrible experiences in, in the field making any films per se. Have you had horrible experiences as a journalist? Uh, one time, the Foxy Brown, I got a gig to interview her for a DVD extra for some Foxy Brown, the Foxy Brown black exploitation films were being released on DVD and they wanted some DVD extras with Foxy Brown, the rapper. And she showed up several hours late and was extremely rude. And I said, you know what? Like you're having a bad day. I actually didn't do anything to you. It's all good. I'm gonna leave, have a great day. And I left, like, it's just not worth it. I've had mostly great experiences. I've never had any bad experiences really in the, in the field interviewing folks. It's usually been pretty good. The Foxy Brown, I just told him, peace out. And how did that end up? I didn't get the check. It was fine. It wasn't <laughs> worth it. it so wasn't she, didn't, check. she didn't, nobody rescheduled. Nobody said we have to do this. It was just like, you know what? He left after I, you know. Yeah, that was it. I, I don't. Maybe they figured it out. They probably got someone else to do it another day, but I wasn't gonna do it. She didn't have she didn't have the respect that I was gonna give her, so it wasn't worth it. Uh, we have a question. Any tips for young documentarians trying to sustain themselves between projects beyond doing what is necessary to survive that adaptability? Do you have any suggestions that are starting uh, for those starting out and trying to immerse themselves in this work? Become a part of a network of fellow independent documentary filmmakers who are trying to get things done because you scratch their back, they scratch yours. You you learn different methods of how people make films. You wind up expanding your network and getting access to resources you might not have had in the past. And other non-filmmaking gigs may come out of that network that can help sustain them at the same time. Um, I know students ask me a lot about creating their own production companies. Um, do you have anything specific to say about that? I, I sometimes have my own thoughts, um, but sometimes, you know, students sometimes see that as a means of something, sometimes they don't. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it depends on the work. I mean, if, you've, if you have a project or if you have a vision, um, Having your own production company is the way to go, but sometimes it's better to sort of get immersed in another production company to learn the ropes before you go out and try to do your own. What do you mean by that, learn the ropes? What are you referring to? Well, everything from rental houses to understanding budgets, who does what, um, being able to get down and dirty resource wise, knowing where you can rent bands for cheap. I mean, all of these things, you might not have access or the need to do things on a certain level on your own. So having the access to those kinds of productions will expand your world in terms of what might even be possible for what you want to do yourself. So in other words, sort of like a, a learn the ropes before you jump in. What, besides the Louis Armstrong, what do you have cooking? What's in your laboratory? Uh, well, there was this film that you were working on uh, about Rick James, which has taken all kinds of interesting twists and turns, but really not much can happen besides editing what's been shot. There's more that needs to be done, and I don't know when that's going to happen, so that's happening. This uh, There's an Ed Sullivan project um, that I've, been pulled into. Um, I know they were trying to put that together for a while. Um, there's a bunch of things that are very speculative right now that I, I don't want to get too deep on, but um, yeah. Is, is that a part of it? Is a part of it having literally multiple irons going on at the same time? And you're just waiting to see what pops. Is that what? Is that what you? Is that 
what you meant when you said when a door opens, you just and you're interested, you walk into it. Yeah, I mean, funding goes away, people get fired, uh, people change their minds. You gotta have a few balls in the air because you can have a lot of balls in the air that land, and you figure out that problem when you when you're lucky to, enough to have that problem. But you know. Even the Ed Sullivan thing, I signed up for it. We're doing a sizzle. They feel confident that they'll get money for it or they'll finance it. Who knows? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, so nothing's really guaranteed unless a network is saying, I'm going to commission you to do this and you know the money's going to be in your bank account. So you got to be fluid with all this stuff. Absolutely. Um, there's so much more I want to ask, but I don't know if it's for public consumption. <laughs> well, we should catch up. Let's catch up later in the week in a minute. Absolutely. We haven't talked to each other in a while, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Josh and I spent almost a year and change working on kind of just working on a bunch of stuff. I was constantly popping into your office mm -hmm. in Manhattan. Um, well, a lot has changed. We should catch up. Oh, wow. Okay. That sounds good. Um, Thank you for being here and answering all these questions. I hope I was a good uh, interviewer. I, you know, again, I, I, I've heard the podcast. It's, it's nice to be a part of it in real time. You know what you're doing. You, you listen to the podcast? That's embarrassing. I'm always embarrassed when people listen to that podcast. Uh, I did long ago. <laughs> I have one more question. Yeah. This is sort of a, a culture question. Um, have you, um, this is one of the students asking. Have you ever dealt with your stories being fetishized, dismissed by those outside of your community, especially when you're crafting nuanced stories from your own community that challenge narratives of trauma porn? How do you navigate this when claiming your own voice and agency over your stories? Well, I think I've, I've had the great benefit of making films that toe a certain line. So if you're gonna do a film with me, I'm the guy who did a film called Burn Motherfucker Burn. Like, so my whole existence is to counter that. Um, and that's the value that I provide. If I didn't have a strong point of view, there'd be no value in what it is that I do. So I'm very cognizant of that. And I'm, you know, sometimes when, when you, you work with people and they'll make certain suggestions, because again, it's a collaborative process, right? And they'll make certain suggestions that might lead one to believe that someone is fetishizing something, which these people very may well be, because I work with a diverse crew of people um, from all walks of life. So sometimes you have to just educate people and say, I know what you meant by that, but this is what's wrong with it. And typically they'll go, oh, you know, I didn't think of it that way. Thank you for hipping me to it. So whatever's within my power, I do my best to make sure that we're cognizant of not falling into certain tropes. And um, that's all I can do. That's that's my part, the part I play in all of this. And hopefully folks like yourselves and other filmmakers can do that as well with their own work. They can do the best they can to make sure that the representation is where it should be. Before you leave, can you talk a little about that? I wanted to talk about um, Burn Motherfucker Burn. Um... Talk about how that piece came about um, and why that was one of the subjects you decided to kind of tackle. Well, it was commissioned by Vinny once again. It was the 25th anniversary, I believe, of you know, the so-called Rodney King riots. Mm -hmm. And um, it turns out there were like eight other films that were commissioned by other people at the same time. So I just wanted to find a way to tell that story, but add value to the conversation. And my value was I spent a lot of time in the Watts, the so-called Watts riots of 65. Um, to me, that's what was going to separate me from everyone else. And what happened in 65, it was police abuse. What happened in, you know, with Rodney King, the same thing. So it's just like really crazy loop of people not remembering history. And when you don't remember history, the same mistakes are made over and over again. And that was a lesson that I learned from my dad, that the importance of history and history isn't as important as it used to be, at least in the mind of the way people program things. So I always try to make sure that I create things that say something. And 
Why burn, motherfucker, burn? Well, in the Watts riots, the catchphrase was burn, baby, burn. You know, that's what people said on the street. Mm -hmm. And when you think about how things remain the same and how the anger boiled, to me, it went from burn, burn to burn, motherfucker, burn. And that's the title of the film. So I wanted the opportunity. I when I when it was offered to me, again the door opened and I ran through it and I put my own stamp on it. Absolutely. I mean I think it's such an important piece. Um and like you said, and there, there there seems to be that through line historically. You seem to really drill down in history and your research and everything. Um and the it's important. You gotta hist history is my best friend. Like if you don't respect history, you're gonna, you're, we're all gonna make mistakes, but you're doomed to like die and make horrible mistakes if you don't respect history. It's, it's one of the most important things. Well, I wanna say thank you for your time uh, on behalf of uh, the CVPA and FABS, the Film and Video Studies Program here at George Mason University. Uh, just wanna thank you for coming out and talking to everybody and expressing your ideas and your thoughts um, so thoroughly um, and so patiently. I really appreciate it. Well, we were trying to do it for a minute, real time, and it didn't work out. And then you got like, yo, we'll cut you a check and you can do it from, from your son's bedroom. How can I turn that down? But thank you guys for, for giving me the opportunity. And, and um, I wish everyone luck with their projects and their pursuits. And let's catch up later in the week, my man. Absolutely. I'll give you a call. I ain't doing nothing. I'm just gardening yeah. yep. and making bread. All right. All right. Take All it right. easy. Yeah.